Okay, th thanks for everyone being here. Um, I'm Fabian Feyer. I'm Marius. Hi. And we have a bit of a um, yeah dish for you tonight. Um, I hope you're all hungry. We we cooked up some some talk for you. Um, okay, more people coming in. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Uh, let, let's see what's on the menu for tonight. Um, we start out by what happened when looking at some code, and then um, suddenly, for the first course today, we have a CTF challenge and how we built that. Then suddenly something happened between that CTF challenge and uh, and the, and we started writing a paper about what we did there, and then. We got some, we, we published this, that paper. And then we got some responses, and we'll talk about those. Um, and yeah, then we have a little DGST for you at the end, uh, what we learned. So that's, that's on the menu tonight. So as you notice here, this is maybe not a typical talk. It's not only that pre we prevent it in the form of a nice menu, but also we want to have more of a storytelling talk, like how we found a technique and what we did with it and so on. So there will be some technical details, but the focus is really here on the storytelling. So to create a, a iconic computer character, stay a while and listen. All right. It all started staring out at some code, as many things do, and then suddenly things happened. So, quick disclaimer before this, um, all of this is fictional. None of the code we will be showing you is uh, in any code bases out there. Um, any similarities bec between code that we'll be showing you and other code bases is purely coincidental, so just keep that in mind right now. So in this hypothetical scenario, I'm looking, reading some code, and I see this um, mem copy up there. I think, hey, that that sounds wrong. There's, I'm copying input onto the stack, and copying minus one of it. There was some some signedness issue. You run across these kinds of things sometimes, and um, what happens here is that minus one will be interpreted as a very large number. So we're copying a lot of input onto the stack, and usually this isn't really exploitable because your program will run into segmentation fault when it runs out of stack space and uh, it'll cr just crash. So yeah, this is like a denial of service, but nothing too critical, right? So I thought, you know what? I'll go ahead and report this. Hey, I think you have a, a stack buffer overflow there, but I don't think it's exploitable, um, right? Like that, at least. Oh, so I'm keeping over the role of a fictitious vendor which may or may not exist. The response is, oh, that's no problem at all. We catch that. Wait, you what? Yeah. You catch that? Yeah, yeah, we do. Check out our fancy zigzag fandler we have here. And then, so let's take a look at that zigzag fandler. So um, we have some... In this C file, we have some fancy try catch magic, and uh, we have uh, we have we install a segmentation fault handler that gets called when our program segmentation faults at the end here, and that throws a, an exception. So wait, we can throw an exception in C? What? Um, so it turns out that this is a, a common pattern um, in a couple of places, and you know it, it kind of makes sense that you know when an error happens, you want to like clean up your state and so on and and maybe report that error back so i mean why not and if you if you go on stack overflow or all the other you know programming tutorial websites you end up seeing sometimes you end up seeing these kinds of things where you people start implementing their own try catch logic because they want try catch and, and see i don't really get why but sure you know you push a a jump buffer which keeps your state onto the stack and then later on you can make some macros that just you know handle the catch and handle throwing and then in throwing you do a long jump to that jump buffer that you had on the stack and this is what was happening here they use that code from stack overflow or i think there's a couple of other websites like it um and then they they basically had that and i thought like hmm wait that's on the stack so the jump buffer is on the stack 
I can overflow the stack and then cause a segmentation fault. The long jump then calls that. So I, everything in that jump buffer contains all of the registers. So I control all of the registers at that point. Wait, what? Yes, I can actually control all the registers and basically something that wasn't exploitable because of that segmentation fault handler, because of that exception handling, kind of be suddenly became exploitable and I thought like, hey, that's cool. Uh, I want to do that and I want to show people this, this technique. It's kind of a cool corner case. So what's best than, you know, cooking up something for, for other people to, uh, to consume? You know what? I'll make a CTF challenge out of this. And then some, some frantic hacking later, um, I decided, you know what, I'll, I'm too lazy to copy paste, uh, code off Stack Overflow, so I'll just use something that has exceptions. I'll just use C++. Everyone loves C++. Um, and it'll, it'll make things easier. It has exceptions handling, so I don't have to re-implement all of that. Um, so, wrote up, you don't have to read this. It's, uh, small for a reason so that you don't end up starting to read it. Well, we'll get to it in a moment. Um, wrote up a small challenge and I said, you know what? I'll make my own little stack protector that throws a, throws an exception and I'll just check whether if I send some input into it, it, it says stack smashing protected or stack smashing protected. It, it does. Sends a bit more. Oops. Something weird is happening. Send even more. Oops. Something even weirder is happening. I thought I was supposed to catch this and like, huh? So yeah, uh, what's happening here? Let's take a closer look. Um, so we fire up GDB, look at what's happening in, in that segmentation fault case. And um, as we expect, we're, we're stash smashing the stack and we have a couple of A's on the stack right now. Um, but something weird is happening. We're segmentation faulting in the unwind handler, which is the thing that's taking, doing all of the exception handling. And if we look at the at the registers, a couple of them are A's, especially RAX is A. Um, if we look at what's happening there, oh, I can't I can't read assembly. Sorry, I can read that assembly. Um, and that's so I'm dereferencing something that's A. That really smells exploitable, you know. I'm I have a pointer. It's being dereferenced. I uh, I can control it pretty much arbitrarily. That really smells exploitable. There's just no way it can't be exploitable. Um, so I thought, yeah, okay, I have my CTF challenge, it's done. So we sat it down in September 2020 and Fubs came to me and said, Hey, I've, I've got the CTF challenge here. I said, sure, okay. I mean, we were preparing our CTF, right? It was about to be around the corner. We usually do it in October. So nice, we have a challenge, great. I said, you know what? I didn't really write an exploit to it, but I'm kind of sure it's exploitable. <laughs> And my response was like, no, we don't release challenges without an exploit. Like, it's just uh, not a so good game design. Let's keep to an exploit. So yeah. the CTF happened. We didn't post the challenges. So yeah. fast forward. One year later. Um, yeah, we do a CTF again. And it's like, hey, Marius, I've got the CTF challenge lying around. And okay, so. I, I, I still don't really have an exploit for it. <laughs> Can you can you take a look and try to make one? Oh no, because some story here, like this happens basically every year in the CTF for us. Fabs has a crazy challenge idea, which he pitches, doesn't have an exploit. We sit down together, waste maybe, not waste, but spend one week beautifully of our time trying to cook up that exploit, which we eventually do, but there's just a weak gun in the meantime. Yeah. And I had the feeling this was one of those cases. So... Yeah, a couple of days later, we had conducted a root cause analysis of the different behavior as a skeleton child FAPS wrote. And let's start looking at what we found, why, or what's happening here under the hood. So the first part is, of course, the expected behavior, right? We execute the challenge, uh, st uh, smash the stack, and then get our custom exception. And now we have the program a little bit more bigger. I hope it's readable also in the back. Um, what we basically have is a main function, which opens a try block, calls a thrower function, and whatever error scores, it has a catch-all clause, it will just print stack smashing detected. The thrower function has a small buffer and would read input from standard input, so from the attacker, and... Uh, 
It reads 100 bytes, the buffer is only 4 bytes, so it will overflow the stack. As there is a stack buffer in this raw function, there will be a canary, which will be overflown if the attacker overflows. However, as we see in the very top there, um, FUBS created this uh, fake uh, stack check fail, so when a canary check would fail, this function would call instead of the usual one. And what this quest, uh, this function does, it's wrote an integer, it's wrote a 1337. So the expected behavior is this will be thrown and catched uh, in the catch block of the main function. Um, on the right here, we see um, uh, the stack layout from the view of the Sorora function. Um, we have on the uh, top of the stack, the buff buffer or at the bottom, uh, then the canary, the saved uh, ASP, and the return address, uh, which would point somewhere into main. Here, that's main plus 10. So if we overflow it uh, with the first case, it looks something like that. We partially overflow the canary, and we go into the canary check fail, as expected, and then the exception is thrown and corked by the catch handler of the main function. So far, so good. That's the expected um, behavior. Now, let's look at the curious behavior. Like, why do we have this output which says, terminate called after throwing an instance of int aborted? Let's look again at the stack layout. We overflow, and this time we overflow partially into the return address, into main, or the, the address on the stack pointing to main, where we should return. Now, the... Um, canary check will still fail, we go back then, but then when the exception handling process tries to find the appropriate um, exception, it cannot find it because the main, uh, the main pointer or the return address is partially overwritten and doesn't point to the original try block anymore. So let's look in detail what happened here. So we have this, uh, this unwinding process goes ahead and looks at each returning return address and tries to figure out, is there a handler for that? And do we have a, a landing pad to continue for that exception? By overflowing and corrupting that return address, the unwinder can't find a handler anymore. So because it uses that handler, it can't find it. We go and we have the normal unexpected case where if something is on there, we can't... Um, we, we can't find that handler. So Unwinder is saying like, okay, there's no handler. We terminate the program. So an instance of int was found. It was uncaught. Let's terminate. So it's doing what it should do, but just it shouldn't, it, it's not finding the handler it should find. So one of the key insights here is the Unwinder is operating on the attacker controlled input once uh, in the case of once we have a buffer overflow. So once we have a buffer overflow, we shouldn't go into unwinding anymore. Um, and the other thing is the unwinder just ignores all the canneries. So even though we have a stack smashing protector on there, it just, we ignore that and we continue unwinding and operating on that, uh, on that attacker control data. So that's bad. So we have those first two cases. What's happening in the third one? Um, why are we segmentation faulting there? I mean, it should also, if we overwrite more of the address, well, it still shouldn't find the, um, still shouldn't find a handler and we should, we would expect it to do the same thing, right? So again, let's take a look. This time we overflow, we do, we fail the canary check, but we overflow a lot of, uh, the, the return address a bit more. So our return address now isn't mapped anywhere anymore. And the unwinder does a weird check. So what happened here? In this case, the return address, there's a big check in, in the unwinding. Every time a frame is unwound, the unwinder will go ahead and check whether the return address, or the, the, the code at the return address, is this weird constant. It looks a bit weird, why these bytes? Um, but yeah, that's just hard-coded in libunwind. Um, so it turns out when you disassemble this, um, or when we overflow this, this points just to something that isn't unmapped, and this check will just segmentation fault because we're reading from unmapped memory there. In the good case, or in the in the happy path, what we would instead be checking against is a syscall, and the syscall would be syscall fifteen, which is um, sig um, sig return which is something that you use in signal handling every t all over the places, and there's a couple of techniques to exploit that as well. 
So this check is really where we're going into and uh, where we're uh, where we're crashing. So with this knowledge, uh, now Fabs went on and made a refined proof of concept because what we saw on the last slide is uh, like like we did, thought it was exploitable in the beginning, but it's not. It's in segmentation fold on the read path, so not too useful. So we built a refined proof of concept. And um, the start of it is pretty much the same as we saw before, right? We have this raw function and some uh, fake stack check fail function. What's new now is a win function, which also has a try block with a thrower and a catch block. And it has a stack local char buffer, which has the contents loose. Um, this win function is never called, uh, just in the program, we did not optimize it away. And then there's a main function, which also has a stack local buffer, which says win. It calls the thrower as we know it, and it catches as we saw it before and terminates stack smashing detected. And if we used our sample exploit we built for this challenge, we would uh, pipe it into the program and get the output win. So what happened here? How do we get uh, to, instead of having uh, the stack smashing protected or detected output, the win output? Um, basically, that's the stack layout we used for exploiting this challenge. We, uh, instead of pointing to main plus something as a return address um, after overflowing from this raw function, we are pointing now to the win function plus something. So an address pointing inside the try block of the win function. And due to this, the unwinder gets confused. When it starts unwinding, it sees its return addresses and sees, oh, of course, we are an exception which was thrown from the win function, so let's execute the catch block of the win function. Even so, once again, this code was never executed in the full program. And so this row ends up here in the catch block of the win function because the unwinder thinks we're coming from here. But the context is still the one from the main function because this is where we're actually unwinding from, which means that the stack local buffer, which is print in the catch block of the win function, is actually bar, which is win. And yeah, this was basically refined, uh, the refined proof of concept. And from here, we started to build a CTF challenge. And actually, we decided to build two CTF challenges, like one easy one, like a baby uh, challenge, which will just show the basic technique, and one harder one, which would use or app use the signal handling, so the special pass with the comparison we saw before, one called p the stack and a lot of nasty details. Uh, anyhow, as story for the challenge, we thought, let's build a CTF simulator, so the players of the CTF called CTF while they CTF. And yeah, that's something how it looks like uh, in the main menu here. And fast forward uh, one month, the CTF started in October. We released the baby CTF simulator in the very beginning of the CTF. And then you can see what happened. Not much. Like no solves, the challenge was there. Just yeah, yeah. being 13, around. Then, 13 hours later, um, you know what? We, well, no one solved it yet. Should we? And we were discussing the release schedule of our, our, our upcoming challenges and thinking about what's the next challenge we should release. I was like, you know what? It's still unsolved. Yes, it is. Um, maybe we should release the harder version of it. Sure, let's do that. That's the best idea what we can do here. So we went on, released the harder challenge, and... Um... Nothing happened. <laughs> Um, so well, yeah, something happened, the CTF ended. Exactly. Eventually the CTF ended and both of the challenges remained unsolved for the course of our uh, CTF, unfortunately. Yeah. However, after I mean, the end, people reached out to us on our Discord server. Um, there was a person asking us what would be the solution for this challenge. And then basically we said, you know what? You kind of exploit uh, a stack buffer overflow and then exploit the exception handling uh, process. And that way you can uh, then uh, end up um, throwing, uh, end up getting code execution that way. So, um, thought that was kind of a clear uh, explanation of it, of the, of the whole process. Um, turned out not so much. <laughs> the question of the person next was, but how do you exploit unwinding? Are there any resources? Um, we thought, you know what? 
Well, I get, I, people are good at hacking who do these ETFs. They, they're going to read the source code. So, um, that's what we did. Um, and then we said, you know what? We, we, we read the source code. Um, and then maybe, but maybe someone is going to make a write up of, uh, of this technique and it'll, it'll be published and people will, will know about it. Um, and there, starting from that, uh, also, there was a very interesting discussion on our Discord. Exactly. Like the small, uh, sentence we saw before us explanation wasn't enough. We started a thread just for the CTF simulator. And to make everything clear, we had something like 50 plus messages to, mm -hmm. uh, kind of get the technique across. So it seemed it was more confusing than we initially thought. Um, and more un unknown, right? Yeah, so and apparently people didn't know about this. Um, at least that was our impression at the time, and we thought, you know what, maybe if no one else is going to uh, take a look at this and make a write-up, maybe we should. So this brings us to the second course uh, on the menu tonight, writing a paper. After the, CT the CTF, we were sitting down again and like kind of brainstorming. Yeah, no one was writing a... a writing up an, uh, a write-up for this. So we thought, you know what, how should we actually publish this technique? Um, how do we get that out to people? And I suggested multiple ways, right? We could write a blog post, we could try to get a frack article, or, I mean, I'm an academic, so one other natural answer was, we could write a paper, but yeah, it's just one of the options. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't written a paper before. Um, I've written blog posts, but never a paper. So I thought, you know what, let's try something new. Um, can't be that difficult, right? <laughs> and um, so then I checked the calendar and saw that Wood, uh, a small workshop, which is good for this type of research, was coming up. And I was pitching, hey, maybe we want to submit the work there. Or should we talk with Cristiano, who is a professor at my research group, and uh, see what he thinks about this? So, yeah, I thought, you know, involving other people and say asking their opinions never, never really a bad idea. So, sure, why not ask him? Um, but I needed to warn Fabs, this could end up in that we need to go for a top tier publication. So, a very, very good paper in that sense. And top tier sounds good, right? It doesn't really sound like, you know, bad. Like, why, why is he warning me? Well, um, easy. It's more work. It will take a while. <laughs> and um, on this side, maybe a little bit of, of background or academic background about conferences or context here. So uh, Wood, uh, the Workshop on Offensive Technologies, is a small, nice workshop which really accepts a lot of hacky research. But in terms of academic outreach, it's uh, considered to have smaller impact. But on the flip side, it's easier to publish compared to the other conferences, what we call top-tier conferences or top-tier academic venues. There are basically four of it, and these require then full-fledged papers, which a lot of uh, experiments, showing impact, large-scale analysis, and so on. So this was really here um, what we were juggling in between. But then, anyhow, we scheduled a meeting with uh, Cristiano, Cristiano Gufrida, and um, yeah, it went something like this. Yeah. We have this neat little trick here. Um, we want to maybe write something about it. What do you think? And Cristiano had a lot of inputs to this. He started with, can't we bypass ASLR using this technique? And thinking of it, we do canaries, but what is about control flow integrity, right? Uh, maybe we could also spin this towards return of the sick return. I mean, we had some work about sick return earlier in this group already. Or... I don't know, we really need to figure out good metrics and experiments and measure the impact. And and if I think of the impact, we will also need example exploits, right? To, to really demonstrate that this is impactful in the real world. You know what? I have a PhD student who can help you. And by the way, we should aim for a top tier paper here. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is pretty much like paraphrased how this discussion goes. And after this, we looked something like this with uh, just crosses in our eyes being a bit dumb, and we call it the Jufrida effect. Um, it not only happened to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyhow, we want to go for a top tier paper. So for what do we need uh, if we want to make write like a target one of those uh, top tier conferences? We can just a short write up probably won't cut it. So we thought, you know what? How about we figure out how to systematize and uh, generalize. 
um, our our attack and try to figure out like boxes to put things in and try to describe it in more you know abstract ways. What kind of primitives do we have and what variations of of this exist? Um, we also thought you know what if we're going to be scientific about things, we we need to perform experiments. We need to measure things. So we need to somehow find a way to measure like how likely is this to be in the in the real world and also how much how useful is it going to be in the real world and from there on um as a as a special case of that we'll also need to re uh, find something in the real world to to build a proof of concept to show you know what this is actually doable so let's start talking about generalization um so we found out that we can bypass stack canaries this way um and there's a couple of other mitigations that we can also take a look at. For example, um, uh, there's uh, uh, shadow stacks and, and other, other control flow integrity things. So, I mean, we can take a look at those. Um, when we're looking at shadow stacks, what kind of implementations are there? Um, well, there's only really two that's being used. One's Android, the other one is on Windows. So, um, right now we were just using Linux to compile all this, so I mean, checking checking whether it works on Android is, is pretty straightforward. So, oops, it works on Android. Um, so what about the other one? I mean, Windows, um, we haven't tried on Windows. Windows uses a completely different uh, exception handling model. So we were kind of surprised that it actually worked on Windows as well. And But yeah, it did. Um, so what about like uh, Intel CET, which uh, is supported at the moment only by Windows? So well, that's a hardware shadow stack implementation. Oops, it still works when we turn on CET. Um, so we tried Windows, we tried Android. Um, maybe we can try other uh, what other operating systems are there. You know what? Let's try iOS and and macOS. Oops, it just works there too. Um, yeah. So, so we had the feeling that indeed generalization is valid. This technique is applicable to a lot of different uh, ecosystems in the software world. Um, so we moved on to the systemization. And there we basically looked at two different things. The first was confusion primitives, which is what can we use? What can we use to confuse the unwinder to do what we want the unwinder to do? Um, of course, the uh, Original exception handler can we, uh, we can we can do for confusion as we showed before, but we can also during unwinding uh, use registers which are restored. We could target cleanup handlers, so uh, which is similar uh, as exception handler, or we can fake sick return frames uh, due to this fun hard coded check. And then the second part in the systemization were gadget capabilities. So once we had the unwinder confused and it went somewhere, what can we do? What do we get out of it? And there we found a forward edge control flow hijack. So basically a function pointer, which is attacker controlled, is just directly called. Uh, inside libsdc++ is one very good example for that. We found backward edge control flow hijack. So basically we could do straight ropping again without needing to care about canaries. Uh, we found arbitrary reads and writes, and we also found arbitrary free primitives. So overall, all in the systemization, we would say we found uh, everything an attacker would want. Um, this brings us to the next question. Does this actually affect real-world software or real software? And that's kind of difficult to find out, right? Um, so we thought, like, what do people actually use these days that we can scrape and figure out, like, what's a good set, set of software? Do people still use Debian? I mean, Debian has repos, which we can just download and check there. So that's what we did. Um, and we took all of the software in the Debian repos and we filtered out all of the software that's just C++ because C++ is, use, uh, uses exception handling. And then in there, we want, we started looking for buffer overflows. Or wait, that's difficult. How do we find buffer overflows? I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of difficult. Um, at least finding a good, like, large set of buffer overflows to check. So, um, okay, you know what? Let's just not look for buffer overflows. That's, that's its own little problem. Let's find a good proxy for um, things that use stack buffers. So things that use stack buffers is, is, is probably also a good proxy. So we looked at, you know, what things use uh, stack canaries because those are only emitted in functions that use stack buffers. So we thought, you know what, we can analyze this. Okay, fine, sure. Um, then 
But we still need, probably will need to, so keeping that problem of finding something, finding stack buffer overflows for later when we need to make a real exploit, um, we moved on and we thought like, you know what, let's try to figure out what attack uh, primitives there are, that are what uh, gadgets that we get. So enter uh, Victor, the PhD student, um, who said, you know what, um, well, the unwinder kind of, uh, uses all kinds of stack variables that are restored on the stack that we can control and w to figure out what we can do. Maybe we can do uh, taint tracking. Um, so taint tracking is a technique to see what uh, what things later on that we can control. Um, and so taint all the attacker controlled registers and all the uh, catch handlers uh, that we have in a program. And then maybe we can write a um, a taint tracking engine for using binary ninja. And then we waited some time after uh, Victor uh, proposed this. Then we had, okay, is it, I hope it's loading. This is what happened. So this is just the, the team tracking engine that that's started appearing, the power of a PhD student. And then Victor said, you know what, I made some analysis. And uh, we have a couple of interesting uh, um, results here, and uh, we uh, here's like a list of all of the all of the gadgets that give specific um, primitives. Like this is how many arbitrary frees we found. This is how many read write what's uh, or write what wires we found. Um, let's make some nice graphs. Nice graphs started appearing. So we have the experiment part of the paper done. But now to the next part of finding a real-world vulnerability, which turned out a little bit more challenging because how would we find a, a good candidate for our technique? <coughs> One intuition we had is we just started looking at OSS files, right? OSS files finds a lot, a lot of stack buffer overflows. But it turns out this data set is actually pretty, or not so good searchable, right? Like, we needed to find a stack buffer overflow in C++, which uses exception handling, or the uh, software to use exception handling. So it was a bit complicated, and we really, really stared a lot uh, inside uh, these OSS fuzz, um examples and tried to find something, but could not eventually find something. So after this, we resorted to the only other sane approach we could imagine to tackle this problem, we ask on Twitter. <laughs> so we asked on Twitter, and just very shortly after that, we got a response from Greg that said, you know what, I, re I kind of remember there's this uh, CVE, and that is in C++, that was a stack buffer overflow. So this was the first uh, real response we got. And I think it was also one of the only responses we got. And it was perfect. Um, was a textbook example where we had a loop that read data onto the stack, and then if it goes out of bounds, we throw an exception. So this is really what we want. We want to corrupt the stack, then throw an exception, and we're done. Um, was a was a pretty old bug from uh, 2009, but I mean, can't be more b uh, perfect than that. And if that's the first bug we get, I mean, sure, it's out there. So that brings us to building the first exploit uh, against real-world software with CHOP. So here enters uh, Pagabook, another friend of us, also uh, known from the CTF community. And the context here is that I was basically visiting University of California, Santa Barbara in this time. The paper deadline was only two weeks away, and I was asking Pagabook, hey, uh, I have this, or we have this work here. You want to help? Like, we need to finish. We need to write an exploit. Wouldn't be fun, like, back in the days, like, playing some CTFs, and he said... Sure, let's do it, uh, with his very positive attitude, and frantic hacking occurred, and yay, we got an exploit for uh, CVE 2009-4009 uh, out of it. So that was pretty cool, and with this, we basically had everything in place for a submission, we started a writing sprint, right, uh, as I said, there were only two weeks to submission when we needed to write the exploit, when we had it, there were three days, four days, so was some, some nice writing sprint. And this happened then in May 2020. We submitted the paper and we're happy. Then it happens what usually happens in academic publishing, silence for a while, until we reach the reviews in July. So two, uh, two months later, uh, of course, we will not show the full reviews. We will just give some excerpts and paraphrase them. Yeah, when I saw that email, I was pretty excited. And then I started reading it. It was like... Okay, the only exploit you have is from 2009. Like, is that even a 
like is that even possible um things like um it relies on human effort uh to do the exploit was was i think one thing we we heard um what about code randomization isn't that a solution to it um or you know what um the general contribution is just unclear um yeah so these all converge to a major revision so we got some more time uh, specifically this was in july we got time until september to fix this make a revised version of the paper and yeah sounds sounds great right we got a channel uh, we got a plan but then of course what comes after july and after we all spent a long time writing exploits and doing like writing sprints well we all needed a break so After July comes August, the summertime. So we all went to vacation, enjoyed uh, non-academic things, and came back to the work in September and realized, oh, hey, exploits. We need exploits and some writing. So we started going back to OSS Fuzz, and a long time later, we found some nice examples that, uh, that we can exploit. So one of these was basically uh, LibRaw, which is a really cool hacking piñata. Every time uh, you want a, a specific type of bug or a bug, go fuzz LibRaw and it'll, it'll, you'll, you'll find something. Um, and then that had a nice little bug in, uh, in the parsing of the maker notes. It's an EXIF tag in Raspberry Pi cameras, which we could abuse and... Um, and actually exploit using our technique, and I think only, at least to the best of our knowledge, only using this technique. Um, there was another bug in um, Smart Card Services, which is a, a piece of software that's used um, on Mac OS to log in using smart cards, um, and their implementation of the parser for the U.S. Uh, Common Access Card, which is the smart card used by the U.S. military, is uh, also vulnerable. And I mean, what is what is a more hacking in the movies than popping a shell by putting a, a smart card into a computer? Um, so that was that was fun. But then we needed to resubmit the paper. Yeah. So we did the resubmission. Like I think again two or three days after we had the exploits finalized and. Lucky for us, it got accepted. So uh, all the things, all the rewriting and the additional exploits really tipped the paper with the bar and we got it uh, accepted and published. And this brings us to the next part, the dessert on our menu, yeah. sweet and salty responses. Yeah, these were these were fun. Um, we, of course, started the disclosure process yeah. uh, pretty early uh, in parallel to our first submission in May, but some vendors requested an embargo and things dragged on, so the disclosure process was really finished only in December. So it took a while. So let's take a look at what some of the vendors said. Um, so Apple, in their usual way, said, uh, yep, we received it. Um, Arm said, um, yeah, can you send some more details? Which, I mean, sure, and then nothing. Um, LLVM uh, or GCC said, uh, yeah, sure, we can talk about it, but uh, we're not going to do that under an embargo. If other people want an embargo, sure, then we'll talk about it later. Um, LLVM said, yeah, okay, no, that's a cool yeah. feature. Or, Google, uh, first Google. Google. <laughs> All right, Google. Google said, yeah, it's not security critical, but um, it might be a cool feature to add mitigation for that. Same was LLVM. Um, and then there's uh, someone who resells an LLVM compiler. Or, well, there's Microsoft first, uh, sorry. Uh, and Microsoft said, okay, that's a security feature bypass, so that's moderate severity. Um, you still need an, an ex a stack buffer overflow to exploit it, so... But still, they, they um, acknowledged it. And then someone who's, who resells an LLVM compiler said, you know what, this is super critical in our LLVM compiler, so um, we're going to actually even give like a, a CV enhancer for that. Um, so yeah, after all of this disclosure, so December, we took our Christmas break and came back, and in January we went on for going public with it. Here is... Uh, tweet which we used for announcing it first uh, our paper in January 2023 where we just, uh, like really uploaded the paper on Twitter uh, we uploaded it on our webpage and tweeted about it and then we started to get in first responses from the community uh, first one really nice was from uh, Bill Dimikapi who said awesome work, I did something similar on Windows planning the blog post and he indeed did the blog post later in January and I can 
really, really recommend it. It's great. It, it's, it's like very complementary to our paper and it's a really good read. And, uh, obviously in a little bit different language than our paper. Um, however, there were also not so nice responses. There was one response which was basically, yeah, well, the exploit community knew about this all the time. Um, and, the, and it's been used in, in a couple of real world exploits. So, sure. I mean, what's the contribution here? And uh, uh, I would like to add here, the contribution is actually great because we made something which was before maybe known behind closed doors public, so the vendors and other people can now take action against this. And that was also reflected by another uh, positive uh, thing that, that reached us, which was one vendor saying, you know what, this actually has helped us uh, argue against allowing unwinding in some contexts, so that's actually pretty good news. And then we got yet another... Uh, Yeah, response in general, which was, I mean, before we had the exploit dev community who allegedly knows about it, but now also the CTF community knows this since at least five years, doesn't it? So we were like, wait a minute, we are in this community. We wrote a challenge, no one know about it. What happened here? So we started some digging and we found indeed two closely related challenges. One from Plate CTF 2014 and one from an on Chinese on-site CTF, DCTF 2017, so indeed five years ago. And uh, this was a write-up to the challenge, so we needed to use uh, Google Translate to understand what this challenge was actually about. And we, uh, with some complications, also managed to retrieve the original challenge files. And it turns out that, yes, it is very related, but in comparison to our technique, Here, after an overflow, um, the unwinder would be confused, but will just return to the original legitimate uh, landing pad. So the canary will be bypassed, but it is just a jump back to the legitimate landing pad, no control through diversion or similar. So one could see our work here as a more of a generalization and systemization of this like proof of concept attacks from these CTFs. Yeah, also it's just very difficult to find um, Lots of security research, uh, resources on the, um, on the on the Chinese um, from the Chinese CTF community because it's difficult to find. And I think one of the issues was actually getting a Baidu account to be able to download that uh, that challenge. Yep. So that brings us already to the end of our talk. We hope uh, you enjoyed it so far. So as a digestive, we just want to shout out what we learned along the way very quickly. So it's actually. In our eyes, pretty cool and pretty uh, useful to start systematizing and, and generalizing uh, different kinds of attack primitives. Um, being able to say, you know what, this is this is what we need to be able to do an attack. This is what we get. Um, that really helps you um, make things more um, understand things more as well. Um, and at the same time. Um, you know, bringing things out from behind closed doors and opening them up so other people actually can find them and make them discoverable is, is also pretty useful. The second one is academic publishing can be fun. Yes, it can be also painful and frustrating, but it also can be fun. I mean, we also got to a little bit frustration with the reviews, but eventually it's also very rewarding after a while. It's a different way to share knowledge to the world. And yeah, it's useful. Like this technique now is documented. Vendors know about it. People know about it. Um, fun and useful. And then finally, I think that the, the takeaway is uh, play more CTFs. Um, make more CTFs. You might find some things that then you end up going down uh, some rabbit holes for, for quite some time. I think this, this whole journey started in 2020. So um, just making a CTF challenge started it out all. So yeah, play more CTFs. And yeah, now we are here for questions and answers, hopefully. Um, a little bit uh, more technical details, like if you want to know more about the technique or exception handling, we gave talks about it in the past um, at Recon and Black Hat. And of course, there's also the paper of the resource. We have a QR code here, which links to our GitHub repository of the technique. All of these resources are also linked there. So if you want to dive in into the technical part of our work uh, beyond what we explained today, feel free to check it out. And with that, we are open for questions. Yeah. All of the source code that you can see, scroll, you can see scrolling through fat quickly is also on there. So if you also want to scroll through that or even use it, go ahead. Any questions? 
Uh, I actually have to uh, thank you, by the way, a really great talk. Um, one of them is regarding ASLR. Um, perhaps I missed something, but the like you can only overwrite like partial parts, right? Unless you have some leak. That's mm -hmm. the first question. Okay, yes, yes. yes. thank you. Yes. And then secondly, um, did you guys, when running on Mac OS, did you guys look at uh, pointer authentication at all? Yes. And what happens with pointer authentication here? Um, I think it depends. There are um, two cases. If you're, uh, if you're, if everything that you're is in your call chain is uh, using pointer authentication, then yes, pointer authentication catches this. If you have um, some libraries that are loaded that are not compiled for ARM64E, you can abuse those. Um, so there's some corner cases and some, some loopholes. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. Thank you.